Our God, there is perhaps no greater thing for us to sing of than your love. When we think about who you are and all of your holy glory, and we think about who we are, it's remarkable that you would set your love on us. Remarkable that you would do the unthinkable in our place and crush the son of your love to purchase our redemption. And no doubt we will sing of this love forever and ever. It is our heart's song, even in these moments, as we reflect on who we once were from your word. Oh God, would you be pleased to grant us clarity, clarity of communication, clarity of understanding uh, your truth, your accurate assessment of the human condition apart from your son, apart from the transformative work of your Holy Spirit, that we might revel in gratitude. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to this great chapter, Romans chapter 8. We're going to continue where we left off last week, discussing life in the flesh. Romans 8 is the new normal of the Christian life, and Romans 8, 5 to 8 is something of a look in the rearview mirror, who we once were, what we were like, what life was like apart from Christ, what was life like apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. There is perhaps no more clear picture of human inability, total depravity, life without the Spirit than this condensed few statements in Romans 8, 5 to 8. And so you know, we're going to take a little more time this morning and walk through what it was like apart from Christ. Again, this is the before and after picture. If you've done a home remodel, hopefully you took pictures before you started the project so that you can look back on the old normal as you're living in and experiencing the new normal. This passage is an opportunity for us to do just that, to look at what life was like apart from the work of the Spirit. We talked about the characterizations of life in the flesh. Remember that Romans 8, 5 to 8 is bracketed by two statements, one in verse 5, those who are according to the flesh, and verse 8, those who are in the flesh. And the descriptions in between describe life pre-gospel, life before you knew Jesus. Well, let's read together, beginning in verse 1, we'll read through verse 8 of Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit." For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We looked last week at the first three of these characterizations of life in the flesh. What is life in the flesh like? Well, first of all, it is an uninterrupted natural disposition. That is, those in the flesh can only do what flesh is capable of. They only do what comes natural. Secondly, life in the flesh is characterized by death. A spiritual death that pervades everything and culminates in physical death and eternal death. And thirdly, we began to look at the life in the flesh characterized as hostility towards God. 
hostility toward God, enmity with God. The sinner has made himself an enemy of God. There is no peace with God in the flesh. There is only war. And we're, we want to continue that characterization this morning. We talked about the fact that this enmity towards God evidenced itself in a number of ways. Love of the world is enmity towards God. Loving what God hates and hating what God loves is an evidence of enmity towards God. A love of sin is enmity toward God. To be in league with the God of this world, Satan, who blinds the minds of unbelievers, who uh, rules and who reigns on this earth, is to be an enemy of God. And then we looked at three ways that men reject the Godhood of God in terms of idolatry, in terms of complaint, and in terms of murder, right? If, if we can remake God in some other way than He is, we'll do that. And the world history of idolatry demonstrates that. Uh, the history of the human heart in our own day demonstrates that. We'll worship and serve any other God than the one true God. We fashion a God after our own likeness. Steve Lawson has said that God made man in his own image, and ever since, man has been returning to favor. That we love to fashion a God that, that we can worship on our own terms. And the history of idolatry and the present state of an idolatrous world tells us that we would make God if we could. And our complaints demonstrate that we would vote God out of office if we could. We would rather see somebody else running the show than the one true God of the universe. And thirdly, the hatred in our hearts would boil over into murder of God if we could. We would commit deicide. In fact, uh, humanity did that very thing. When God came in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, what was the response of the darkness to the light? Extinguished him. They killed him. Of course, this was God's plan from the beginning, that Jesus Christ would die in the place of sinners to pay for sin. We've seen these numbers of ways in which man sets himself opposed to God, makes himself an enemy of God, perpetrates war against God. And, and these things can't be seen as anything but hatred of God. And there's one last way we want to discuss this morning, and perhaps this one is most tragic. It is hostility of God manifested in rejection of the gospel. In what ways is man hostile towards God as as Romans 8 tells us, natural man is. He's hostile towards God in the rejection of the gospel, either in irreligion or in religion. To reject the gospel is the blind man refusing the free gift of sight. It's the deaf man refusing the free gift of hearing. It's the lame man who never wants to walk again. It's the dead man refusing life. This is what Jesus said in John 5, 40. You will not come to me that you might have life. And the free offer of the love of God through the gospel is rejected by the natural man. The natural man can't stand the gospel, even though it is the best thing ever. What a manifestation of, of natural man's hostility towards God than that when God freely offers again and again and again, not only a stay of execution, but the offer of eternal life, that man would stiff arm God and reject the gospel. And they might do so through irreligious, immoral living, the, the kind of living that says, I don't care what anybody says, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do, and I'm going to make my own way, and they might sing the anthem, I'm on a highway to hell, happy about it. But it also manifests itself, this hatred for God and the rejection of the gospel through religion. The kind of person that says, no, I want rules. I want somebody to tell me what to do, because I think I can do it. And the offering to God of religious moralism instead of simple faith is a hatred of God manifested in a rejection of the gospel. It is to substitute my own corruption to meet the demands of God's holy righteousness. Righteousness. 
and to assume that it's acceptable to him. This is the very problem that plagued the Apostle Paul before he was the Apostle Paul, when he was the self-righteous Saul. And it is the very thing his heart bled for, for his own countrymen. If we fast forward a couple of chapters, Romans 10 tells us this, I testify about them, that is the Jews, his own countrymen, that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And here we see hostility towards God manifested in the lives of people who have oriented their whole existence around God and around His Word and around the attempts through self-effort to meet God's standard. It is not only folly, but it is hostility. To to offer up to God what I can do for you while simultaneously rejecting what God does for sinners freely by grace. What can that be but anything but hatred for the gospel? Hatred for God's own gracious provision through his son. For God to go through the unthinkable effort of killing his own son in the place of wretches. Only to be met with the response of the wretch saying, hey, my wretchedness is good enough for you, God. Forget that son thing. I've got my, I've got my problem handled. That is religion of man. And what a hatred of God it is. What a hostility toward God and a hostility toward God's ways and especially a hostility towards God's grace and love and kindness and mercy such rejection of the gospel is. And the contrast to hostility towards God in verse 7 is peace in verse 6. Life in the Spirit is life and peace. Life in the flesh, death and war. What a remarkable thing the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. Brings one to God on his terms and gives life where there was only death. And brings peace where there was only war. This is the new life, life in the Spirit. And it's contrasted with these manifestations, these characteristics of life in the flesh. The fourth is described in the second half of verse 7. It is insubordination to God. We've seen an uninterrupted natural disposition, death, hostility to God, and now fourthly, the fourth characteristic of life in the flesh, insubordination to God. Look what Paul says at the end of verse 7. The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It it doesn't want to be under God's authority. One significant way life in the flesh expresses its hostility towards God is in its stance towards God's instructions. It does not subject itself to the law of God. Now, we've already seen in this passage that the word law is a flexible term, but we need to allow each verse to... Uh, say what it means by the use of the word law. We saw that it is used as law, as a life principle, a governing principle in terms of the law of the spirit of life setting us free from the law of sin and of death. And here, law tied to God, the law of God, the law which comes from God, the law which belongs to God, is an important category Here, the the law being described is that which God uses to regulate his people. And in a very broad usage, law of God just simply refers to God's revelation of himself and the regulation of his people. And when you see the, the law of God given in the word of God in various stages throughout salvation history, you should understand that God is revealing something about himself. It's not just about giving rules. But he is disclosing himself, revealing his own character and his nature and his purposes and his promises through the giving of law. And he is also regulating his people. What a kindness of God to show us about himself that we might know him, which is the point of the Bible, and then to kindly give us instructions on how to live. 
And in every era, God has done this very thing, such that when you see the, the law of God described in Scripture, sometimes it, it just has a very broad definition, which simply means the Bible, the Word of God as a whole, can be called the law of God. I want you to see this in a couple of places. Psalm 19 Psalm 19 describes God's self-revelation. And God reveals himself through the created order in verses 1 through 6 of Psalm 19. We would call that general revelation or what God declares about himself through nature. Right? It's what Paul describes in Romans 1, that, that God has made himself known through what has been made so that men are without excuse. And natural revelation can't save anyone. It's only enough information to condemn and so in Psalm 19, you have six verses of a description of God declaring himself through the created order. The heavens are screaming out the glory of God, and everybody should look up and look around and look down through the lenses of a microscope and look through the lens of a telescope and say, wow, God is great. <laughs> it's not enough to save. And so we get special revelation or God's self-disclosure through his word in verses 7 to the end of verse 19. I want you to read with me verses 7 through 9. And notice the way the word law is used in this description of God's word, the Bible. The law of Yahweh is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true. They are righteous altogether, more desirable than gold. Every one of these poetic parallel statements in Psalm 19, 7 to 9 are a description of God's word. And notice what is in, paral in parallel, law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, and judgments. And by themselves, any of these words can have a number of different meanings, but here in poetic parallelism, they all point to the same thing, the Word of God, the Scriptures. And notice how they're described. Uh, the Word of God is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. And notice the results in parallel. Restoring the soul, making wise the simple, rejoicing the heart, enlightening the eyes, enduring forever, righteous altogether. And so you see in Psalm 19, the use of the, the law of God, this phrase is nothing more than a description of the entirety of Scripture. This is God's self-revelation of himself to his people. And it includes what we might consider law in terms of rules and regulations, but it is much more than that in its broad usage. Turn to Psalm 119 for a similar example. And I'll summarize some of the statements in one paragraph of Psalm 119, verses 97 to 104. There the psalm writer declares, Oh, how I love your law. Law, singular. Again, an um, umbrella description of the word of God. He says, it is my meditation all the day. In verse 98, he says, your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. Verse 99, your testimonies are my meditation. Verse 100, I have observed your precepts. Verse 101, I may keep your word. Verse 102, I have not turned aside from your ordinances. Verse 103, how sweet are your words, or literally your promises, to my taste. And Psalm 104, uh, verse 104, from your precepts I get understanding. Law, commandments, testimonies, precepts, word, ordinances, promises, all used in parallel fashion to describe the scriptures, God's self-revelation through his word. And, and so in a very broad sense, this word law of God, this phrase law of God, can simply refer to God's word, God's word. And of course, there are more specific uses of this word law. That is God's set of regulations for his people. And in the Mosaic era, that was bound up in what we call Mosaic law. That is the law that God gave to his people through Moses. 
And, and sometimes the, the law of God refers specifically to the law that God gave to the Israelites through Moses. Of course, the Mosaic law came under transition in the era that the New Testament was written. Jesus is running under Mosaic law and with Mosaic law to its intended end, the end that God intended for it, uh, to regulate the people of Israel under the theocracy. And Jesus completed, fulfilled Mosaic law, ran it to its intended end. And, and sometimes it's difficult to understand some things in the New Testament as they relate to Mosaic law. And we have to understand that the New Testament itself is a transition period where God is revealing himself anew and regulating his people. And sometimes in this transition, we might be tempted to think, wow, if I'm not under Mosaic law, does that make me lawless? And isn't that the definition of sin? Sin is lawlessness. What happens if Mosaic law goes away? Do we tremble in fear that I have no more regulation? And if you compare the numbers of regulations under Mosaic law, some 660, with the numbers of commands in the New Testament, some 1,100, we very quickly realize we're, we're not derelict, morally adrift without some direction from our gracious God who is kind enough to tell us how to live. And we see in the New Testament a polemic against the misuse of Mosaic law. Galatians and, and Romans, uh, even the book of Acts, a lot of the New Testament descriptions of Mosaic law is a, a help for Jews who are tempted to misuse Mosaic law. Circumcision, the Sabbath, dietary restrictions. Shouldn't the Gentiles be doing these things? Because we had to do these things. And if you're going to be right with God, you've got to do these things. And a lot of the New Testament was written to correct that misunderstanding. Number one, doing those things never made you right with God anyway. And now that God himself has transitioned to do something a little bit different, it's not totally dissimilar from what he did before, but there are dissimilarities that demand a new set of regulations. And now that God is doing this, there were those, the Judaizers, who wanted to reimpose that which was now obsolete onto those who claimed to love God. So much of the New Testament polemic against law is a polemic against the misuse of God's good law revealed to Israel in the Old Testament through Moses. Doesn't make the law bad. Just bad if you use it for the wrong things. Out of place, out of time, wrong people, wrong use. That should never lead us to think, oh, I shouldn't read my Old Testament. I should hate Mosaic law. No, it should lead us to a, a higher elevation of God's desire to reveal himself and to regulate his people every time he comes to his people. And of course, in the New Testament, we find a polemic against the use of any law to merit righteousness to establish righteousness, to prove my righteousness, or to judge the merits or demerits of others. That's called legalism, right? A wrong definition of legalism is this, I want to obey God, <laughs> or we should obey God. That's not legalism. Some people paint that as legalism. Following God's directives for our lives, Jesus says, is called love. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Legalism is when we are attempting to bootstrap our own righteousness, to, to take what we do and shove it in God's face and say, look what I've done. I've earned a place in your presence. And legalism is when we take the actions according to rules of other people and we lodge against them the demerits of their activities from the high point of our so-called righteousness. That's legalism, judgmentalism moralism. And God despises these things. And so the New Testament is full of the polemic against the misuse of law in those ways. But we can't stop there when we see the word law, especially the phrase law of God. We must understand it in its most basic form is a good thing. It's a good thing, the law of God as the revealing of his own character and as the kind regulation of his people. The law of God is good. 
law of God is good. A number of New Testament affirmations of God's law spoken in this broad sense. I'll give you one example from the book of Romans. Uh, Romans 13, 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of law. That is a good view of law, something we should aspire to. James 1.25 and James 2.12 both call God's regulation of his people a law of liberty. A law of liberty. That is, it is the regulation of God's people under the banner of grace, under the banner of the freedom that is in Christ. And freedom in Christ, liberty in Christ, freedom from slavery to sin, freedom from the tyranny of law as a slave of sin is not lawlessness. It's actually called a law of liberty. Sin is still lawlessness in the New Testament. But listen to 1 Corinthians 9.21. We Christians are not those who are being without the law of God, but we are actually under the law of Christ. So even if God has transitioned his people from Mosaic law unto a new set of regulation, he has not left us lawless. We are said not to be out from under the law of God, but actually under the law of Christ. And I believe here in Romans 8, what Paul has in mind is this broad intent. The law of God as his gracious self-disclosure and his kind governance. His revelation and regulation to his people. And how is life in the flesh characterized? Insubordinate. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. You see, the irreligious man hates God's regulations and refuses to be told what to do. But the religious man makes believe he can keep God's regulations. And both are insubordinate. And sometimes we're tricked by this. What do you mean life in the flesh means he does not subject himself to the law of God? I've seen that guy. He goes to mass every day. He he goes to church every week. He reads his Bible all the time. In fact, I can't think of anybody who keeps the rules better than him. He's always telling other people to keep the rules. And a man in the flesh can do all of those things and not have Christ And he has not brought himself under subjection under God's law. In fact, he may be able to acknowledge that there's such a thing as wrong and right. He might even acknowledge that God's law is good. The Bible-reading unbeliever, the the church-going unrepenter, is able to put theological camouflage over his insubordination. He's able to fool people. By going to church, by keeping rules, by holding rules over other people, he he looks to others as if, man, that guy loves the law of God. It's all I hear from him, law of God, law of God. And yet internally, by by shoving his own merits before God as, as what he thinks will be pleasing, or maybe even as a way to elevate the esteem of himself in front of others by being better than the other guy at a human level is actually hostility towards God. Someone could spend his whole life working to obey the Bible and still be outside of Christ. And we have an example of such a man in the author of this text, Paul the Apostle. Even under that narrower view of the law of God, meaning Mosaic law, Paul was such a man who who grew up under law, knew law, memorized law. Paul was a legalist. He knew all about what pharisaical hypocrisy was all about. A sincere devotion, and I believe he was sincere, to the good law of God while still a slave of sin. What did that look like for the Apostle Paul? I think Paul knew what he was talking about in Romans 2 when he indicted the Jews who were under Mosaic law and still enemies of God. He says, therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. You who judge, practice the same things. Paul knew what it was like to be a Jew and to adhere to the law of God under Moses and to hold it over others and to never have met God's righteous standard himself. A hypocrite. The very same kind of man that Jesus indicts in Matthew 23 in all of those woes against the Pharisees. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. 
you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. These things are offensive to God. And, and as, as Scott led us through the end of Romans 7, we see in verses 14 to 25 the picture of a man who sincerely loved the law of God and was a slave of sin and felt the weight of that, the impossibility of it. A man who knew he needed rescue to be brought out from under the dominion of sin, under the dominion of grace, to have a new relationship to sin and a new relationship to the law of God. In Philippians 3, Paul, reflecting back on his pre-Christ days, talks about his relationship to Mosaic law. Look at Philippians 3 for a moment. This is another great window into the before and after picture of what the transformative work of the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer, how the gospel changes everything. Paul describes his former accomplishments, beginning in verse 4. I could put confidence in the flesh far more than others, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Of course, not before God, but before men. Nobody would have accused Paul as being a lawbreaker or being a, a lawless one. But actually, above blame in keeping the law. No one could find fault in Paul but God knew. And so the man in the flesh, like Paul was in the flesh, is actually said to be not subject to God's law. Replacing the righteousness that God gives with a self-earned, self-merited righteousness of their own. Exchanging grace for legalism. Fleshly obediences do not conform to the standard of the law that God demands. Paul goes on in Philippians 3 to talk about what it meant to exchange all of those accomplishments for Christ. I give them all up and consider them as a stinking pile of rubbish compared to Christ. That's a reflection of the truth that the Bible has always known. Isaiah 64, 6, their righteousnesses were as filthy rags before the Holy One of Israel. And the problem is worse than merely the natural man does not subject himself to the law of God. He is, verse 7, not even able. Not even able to subject himself to the law of God. This is part of the doctrine of human depravity. Of course, human depravity is universal. That is, it involves every single one of us. But also that human depravity is total, that means it involves every part of who we are, every part of the human capacity, everything that makes up the human constitution, not just bad activities, but the root of those activities, thought life, the affections, what you love and what you hate, and your will. All of it is corrupt. And universal total depravity does not mean that every human being has, every done, has always done everything they possibly could have done, as bad as it could be, but that every human being is contaminated through and through. Universal total depravity. A significant part of that total depravity is the doctrine of inability. And it comes from verses like Romans 8, 7. The man in the flesh, the natural man, can only do what is natural to him, and he cannot, he is unable to, subject himself to God's law. And when he attempts to subject himself to, law, to God's law, it is only in the phony, hypocritical sense of the Pharisee outside of Christ. Not in any way that's pleasing to God. The man in the flesh is not even able to subject himself to God's law. Why? Because he's a slave of sin, a child of wrath, 
He is a sinner by nature, and he can only act from his own makeup. A polluted fountain can only bring forth polluted water. A bad tree produces bad fruit and can do no other. Everyone outside of Christ is a slave of sin, Jesus said in John 8, 34. They are not free to subject themselves to God's law. And by the way, this slavery is not some external compulsion. Like, oh, I, I want to be subject to the law of God. I try. I've got it in me. I've got what it takes. But there are these people outside me that hold me down. Now, this is a slavery to your own inclinations. You're a slave of your own corruptions. You can only act according to your own nature. It's like saying, well, I'm free to fly, but, but, but outside things are holding me down. No, I, I don't have wings. I don't have it in me to do that thing that I think I'm free to do. I, I'm a slavery, I'm in slavery to gravity. I can't break the surly bonds of earth because... I don't have it in me to do so. Natural man is inclined against God, inclined against his demands. And the contrast to this is the life in the spirit actually lives a life subject to God. Turn back to Romans 6. We saw this in the deliverance from slavery to sin we're not transferred from one slavery to, okay, you're just totally free to go do whatever you're capable of, but it's a transfer to another kind of slavery. And usually slavery is just a bad word we associate with bad things, but slavery to righteousness and slavery to God are good things. It's actually called life and liberty, and we might call it the pursuit of happiness. Romans 6.18, having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And verse 22, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. This is good news. And the natural man, unable to subject himself to the law of God, when set free by Jesus Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, is now free to be enslaved to righteousness, free to be enslaved to God, and to derive all the benefits of that union. What a glorious truth. The contrast to uninterrupted natural disposition is a new supernatural disposition. Life in the Spirit. An unbroken relationship of a new governance by the Holy Spirit of God indwelling a believer. And the contrast to that second characterization of life in the flesh, death, is life in the Spirit, is life. Life, verse 6. The contrast to hostility with God is now peace with God, verse 6. And, and the contrast to insubordination to God in verse 7, is a new subject to God reality. We actually love submitting our lives to Him. You know when you've discovered your own inability in any task? When you realize that you're not as good a plumber as you thought you were, and you have to call Nick O'Neill and you say, hey, do you know anybody? I need help. There's a liberty in that. The liberty in the Christian life is a new ability to please God. I, I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ who can do all things. And the Holy Spirit who indwells a believer brings us from one glory to another in conformity to Jesus Christ, something you could never do. You didn't do it before you knew Christ and you were not even able to do so. And now willingly you bring yourself subject to him. And he does all things well. There's a final characteristic of life in the flesh. It's found in verse 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And this really is a summary statement of everything that's been said in verses 5 to 8. You can't please God in the flesh. And notice this 
starts with this characterization, those who are in the flesh, literally the ones being in flesh, this continual existence in sinful nature. And this summary statement of verse 8 wraps up all of the description of life in the flesh in one shocking assessment. Human beings do not have what it takes to be pleasing to God. Think about Matthew 18 and Jesus' description of that debtor. You know, the guy that owed his master uh, an incalculable amount of money. And if you put a $10 an hour wage on Jesus' parable, the guy owed $1.25 trillion. If we assume that he couldn't pay that back at once and had to take out a loan at interest. Let's say he took out a 15% loan. I I know that's a high interest rate. It was just easy math. $23.5 billion a month he would owe on the interest to pay back that astronomical debt in that parable. And, And what did that debtor say? Oh, give me time and I'll pay it all back. Give you time, you're accruing $23.5 billion every month. More time only means more liability. It's impossible for you to repay the debt. And it is impossible for the natural man to please God. Every attempt only accrues more liability. It's not just that he doesn't have what it takes. It's that everything he is and everything he does only provokes God's anger further, removing him further and further and further from the possibility of hope. What do we mean it's impossible for unbelievers to please God at all? I mean, isn't there relative good? Don't bad people do good things sometimes? And we would have to acknowledge that bad people do gooder things than they otherwise could have. It's true. I think we can speak of relative good. Jesus speaks of relative good. He says, you being evil, you being evil. That's an ontological statement about essence and being and who a person really is. You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. Listen, it's better that an evil dad give nice things to his children, that a mother make provision for his kids. It's a good thing that a Marine jump on a live grenade and lay his life down and saving his friends. D-Day is good. But, but those are relative good, and, and they're a reflection of God's restraining of sin to keep the totality of humanity from being absolutely everything that it could be, to to keep us from living up to our potential. There is a restraining power of God that one day will be taken away, which will usher in the worst period of anarchist rebellion the world has ever known that will result in the complete annihilation of the rebels of God. And in the meantime... Man's not as bad as he could be. We would just chalk this up to God's kindness, what theologians have called God's common grace. He restrains evil, and and that's a gift from him. And while we could affirm any individual good action, that thing might be good in a relative sense, at a horizontal level, gooder than other things that could have been done, but not in any vertical sense, not in any meritorious sense of being pleasing to God. However materially good an action may be in and of itself, to qualify as pleasing to Him requires a union of that act with faith. Hebrews 11.6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Very clear statement. Any act of relative good by itself, not joined with faith, Vital union of resting in God, trusting in Him, belief in the gospel, cannot be pleasing to Him. Secondly, if it's not done for God's glory, it's sin. It's just sin if it's not for the glory of God. To love God with all the heart, heart, soul, mind, and strength is the first and greatest commandment. And to have any relatively good action not tied to that greatest commandment actually doesn't please Him. You can meditate later on Isaiah chapter 1. I'll just summarize, summarize for you verses 10 to 15 of Isaiah 1. The prophet there 
indicts Israel for their prayers and their sacrifices. Things God himself commanded, good things. But they prayed without a heart joined by faith to him. They actually prayed in hypocrisy. And they sacrificed to God while in their hearts still serving their idols, exalting themselves, not loving people around them. And God says, I've had enough. Don't pray. Don't sacrifice. Listen, it's good to pray, but those prayers weren't pleasing to God. It's good to sacrifice. It's actually sin not to obey God's commands about prayer and sacrifice. But to pray and sacrifice without a heart pleasing to God is to displease Him further. I know that we tend to think highly of our own abilities, and perhaps especially in spiritual things. But listen carefully to God's assessment of what we are able to do. Jesus in Matthew 7, 18, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Matthew 12, 34, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. John 6, 65, for this reason I've said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by the Father. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, for they are spiritually appraised. John 14, 17, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. In John 8, 43, Jesus said, why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. Do you understand the depths of human inability? Life in the flesh cannot please God, can't see the kingdom of God, can't hear God's word, can't see, can't please him. This is a slavery to inability which no man can free himself from. But the gospel, Jesus said, if any man comes to me, I will make him free. And if you come to Jesus, you will be free indeed. And the contrast to life in the spirit is the life in the spirit is a life that actually is a life lived pleasing to God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. A Christian can please God. Romans 14, 18, he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, we make it our ambition to be pleasing to God. Ephesians 5, 8, and 10, you formerly were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Philippians 4, 18, I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied. I've received from Epaphroditus what you've sent, a fragrant aroma, acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, Finally, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. See, the Christian life is a life that is lived as pleasing to the Lord. First, by justification. God has declared you righteous, and you can only ever in his courtroom be pleasing to him. And yet also, lived out in the Christian life, we make it our ambition, and we actually carry out things that are pleasing to him. This is not possible in the flesh. It is only possible by life in the Spirit. And so how miserable is the lost state of man? where these things are unattainable, inaccessible, impossible. 
And if you're here this morning and you recognize maybe for the first time that you have been at enmity with God, you have stiff-armed his free grace and his love in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have found yourself unable to please him for all your efforts, unable to clean up your own life and solve your most critical dilemmas. You must know that Jesus Christ offers you life and freedom and hope. You turn to him and you will find yourself to be a new creature. And the new creature perspective, this new normal, looking back on the old normal, is a wonderful perspective. You and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, get to see with much more clarity what the old life was like. Much more clearly than you can see it when you were in that old life. And what a remarkable grace this is. There are significant implications for us thinking through life in the flesh. If you're a believer here in Jesus Christ, you're no longer in that category. Why think about it? Why have verses 5 to 8 in this chapter? I think we need to reset our expectations for an unbeliever. If you've got unbelievers in your home, unbelievers in your family, unbelievers you work with, to expect them to do spirit life things when they are capable only of natural things is a wrong expectation. God's demand is appropriate. What God demands of their lives is, is right and good, but their inability predicts the outcome. That They won't be able to do that which pleases God. This ought to adjust our expectations, and it ought to force us to have an urgency to rely on God's remedy. A supernatural work has to happen if they are to be pleasing to the Lord. This also, I think, resets our expectations of the natural humanity around us. What do we expect of the world without the gospel? If the gospel is not the remedy, what could the world possibly do that would be pleasing to the Lord? Without the Holy Spirit's work in the individual lives of unbelievers, what could they possibly do that matters for eternity or is pleasing to the Lord? This ought to reset our expectation for natural man's remedies to spiritual problems. The natural man doesn't have access to the kinds of things that the Holy Spirit actually does. And man's solutions to life problems are no match for God's transformative work. This ought to, again, push us to the urgency of gospel proclamation of prayer and a helplessness apart from the work of the Spirit to do the work that men need. And I think the clear view in the rear view mirror of who we were in that state of nature helps us to see sin for what it is that we might end the Christian life in this mixed condition where we still have residual depravity, but we have the indwelling spirit too. This is going to lead us to the rest of Romans 8 where we learn by the leading of the spirit to put to death the deeds of the body. Seeing who we were outside of Christ, seeing what sin really is, I think gives us a sense of urgency to mortify sin. <laughs> to put to death remaining sin in us, to see the Spirit continue and to complete His work. And then lastly, looking back promotes gratitude. I once was lost in darkest night. Let's pray. God, we come to you now with those words on our lips, eager to sing of your grace and your love, that you have given to us in the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, to reflect on who we were, what we were like, and what was our wretched state, brings us to humility and renewed praise and an eagerness to sing together of your saving work. Would you be pleased, O oh God, even today, to bring clarity to any here that within the sound of my voice who do not yet have Christ? Would you bring them eternal life and freedom, subjection to you, and eternity? We ask it in Jesus' name.